Hey guys, welcome to Physio Reviews. My name is Alexi, aka No Bullshit Physio. And in this series, I appraise popular fitness and musculoskeletal rehab approaches through a scientific lens. Let's go. So today we're talking about move you, go to, and functional patterns because I criticize them a lot and people ask me why. Um, there's a lot to say. So I'm gonna release it in parts on Instagram and I'm gonna release the full part on YouTube so you can go check that out right now. Um, to understand what I have against them, first we need to look at the difference between correlation and causation. And more precisely, we need to look at the difference between prospective studies and retrospective studies. So a prospective design is when we look at people before an event or characteristic has manifested itself. And then we look if they develop pain or another outcome that we're looking at in the future. A retrospective design is the opposite, is when we look at people after they've developed the outcome we're looking at, and then we see, do they have this characteristic? So for instance, if we look at gray hair and old age, uh, if you do a retrospective design on that, what you'd see is like, hey, you know what? Maybe people get older because they have gray hair. Whereas if you did a prospective design, it'd be quite obvious that you know people get gray hair as they age. So this is relevant because if we're talking about move you and functional patterns, one of their mainstays is to blame posture and abnormal movements for pain. And if we do look only at retrospective studies, there is an effect like a correlation between those and pain. But if we exclude the retrospective studies and only look at prospective studies, which are, as I mentioned, stronger, that relationship kind of disappears. So it implies that there's no causation. So this is pretty obvious if we look at the shoulder joint uh, where Hogan and all in 2020 took all the prospective studies uh, that were high quality and ran a meta-analysis. Now what they found was that uh, scapular dyskinesis, so so-called abnormal shoulder movements, were not related to the onset of pain or uh, injury. So yeah, scrap that. Furthermore, Takeno and all did a systematic review in 2019, look at a motor control exercises and at the scapula, so the shoulder blade. What they saw was that people did get significantly better in terms of pain and disability, but then when they looked at if people were moving any different, the answer was no. So basically people got better, but it's not because you're actually controlling movement better, it's not because you're moving any different. After that, uh, another systematic review and meta-analysis by Kronz in 2020 looked at knee abduction moments and angles. So basically how you're landing and like how you're controlling the force and they didn't see any association with future ACL injuries. That same year, Romero, Franco, and colleagues went further and looked not only at ACLs, but any non-contact knee injury and any uh, biomechanical flaw that they couldn't identify. So all the components of knee valgum, so hip internal rotation, hip abduction, knee abduction, and all that stuff. So what they found, and I'm sorry, go to boys, but they found no association that was consistent between injuries and knee uh, biomechanical flaws the so-called biomechanical flaws. So before people point me to the evidence, evidence. I have like video footage, yes, catastrophic knee valgum, so knee caving in, is definitely one of the mechanism of injuries for ACL, and probably, actually, it is the most common, but that doesn't mean that some degree of it is unsafe. That'd be like saying, you know, if you jump from a building that's 20 stories, you're gonna die. Yes, you are, but like, does that mean that jumping is bad? No, you know, you gotta be relative and science is in gray areas. So just think of that before you start using Gota and start walking like this, you know? It's fine if you walk a little bit on the side, it's fine. Additionally, if we look at the work that Kim Benow did on people with knee OA in 2010 and 2013, we see that her randomized control trials on strengthening exercises of the knee and the hip didn't show any changes in the way people were moving. After that, she tried uh, in 2013 to make people move specifically differently by doing neuromuscular exercise, which is aimed at also quality of movement, not just getting stronger. And again, people got better, but it didn't change how they were moving. So basically people were just feeling better and were carrying on with their lives. So basically what we see from exercise is that, you know, besides some very specific cases, people become more low tolerant from the movement, but it's not because they're moving any different. And that wouldn't make sense. Like why would we evolve to move a very specific way and then be able to move all these different ways? That would make no sense in my opinion, all right? If we move on to posture, we see that Christopher T. Swain did a systematic review of all the systematic reviews in 2019, and he did find a correlation between posture and pain, but if we took out the retrospective studies and looked only at the prospective studies, which again, have a better design and are more reliable, 
what we see is that, you know, that correlation kind of goes away, implying that the link was not causal. So basically when people have pain, they move differently, but it doesn't mean that's why they had pain. The same way that if you sprain your ankle, you're going to move differently. You're going to limp, but it's not, you didn't sprain your ankles because you're limping. So the reason approaches like GoTo, move you and functional patterns work, work is probably because, you know, people are offloaded because they're told, you know, moving is dangerous and then they're reloaded in a different way that keeps offloading them a little bit, you know, cause sometimes when you're in pain, if you move differently, it's going to offload that zone. After that, they get better just cause they're moving a little bit and movement is medicine. It's not because these movements are special or anything and their approaches do have some harm in the long term, in my opinion. The first argument against these approaches is that it creates a uh, fear of movement that can be harmful in the long term because you're vilifying movement where there's no scientific reason that's valid to vilify them because they seem safe. And that can create pain where there should not be pain, which is called the nocebo effect. The effect is so strong that it can negate the effects of a powerful opioid painkiller. I have a video uh, on it with Ben Inglis that you can look up in my educational guide. The second argument against these approaches and one of the reasons why they're probably selling that well is that they perpetrate ideas about the human body that they're fragile and that they're going to hurt themselves if they don't move right in their sp very specific and special way and you know these beliefs have been found to be correlated with chronic pain so you're potentially just may increasing the risk that people are going to transition from an acute condition that would get better on its own to a chronic pain condition the third argument against them is that you know it's just not scientifically accurate you're promoting information that is not accurate and has been disproven years ago so shut the f up the fourth argument against these approaches is that they keep people away from heavy load either for too long or forever which is problematic because these heavier loads seem to be more optimal for health benefits so basically they can make you stronger and healthier quicker because it takes fewer reps to achieve the same result with a heavy load compared to a light load and all that for no valid scientific reason as aforementioned so in the case of MoveU, they lock people away in movement jail and tell them, for instance, you can't load your squat if you don't master your big toe. You can't master your squat if you don't master your pelvic tilt or some other bullshit. Uh, this can suck, especially for like strength athletes who want to get back to their sport because that's what they enjoy. So MoveU delays, but functional patterns is even worse in that they tell people never to lift again. One of the reasons that they think that people are going to get more bulky, less athletic and less mobile despite this being disproven by the systematic review that Alfonso uh, did in 2020, showing that people get as mobile from uh, strength training through a full range of motion than they do from just mobility work in general. So that's bullshit again. To add to this, the systematic review and meta-analysis by Pardos Maynard in 2021 uh, looked at plyometric training and compared it to resistance training. And what they found is that was that while resistance training was not as effective as plyometric training to increase measures of athleticism like running, jumping, and changes of direction, uh, they were both effective. So basically, you're not getting slower from doing resistance training. It's just maybe not the best way to get faster and more explosive. But again, it won't make you slower. And a good example is any running back in the NFL. They're jacked out of their minds. And I guarantee you, I bet a million dollars that they beat any functional pattern coach uh, that you know in a test of like sprinting or running. So basically, Nadi Aguilar, the founder of Functional Patterns, managed to scam people away from two of the main reasons people engage with uh, fitness in the first place, which is, you know, acquiring more muscle mass and becoming more functional in day-to-day -day life. Basically, he took uh, three of the main and most functional exercises in weight training, which is, you know, bench, squat, and deadlift, which are basically pushing something, picking up something from the floor, and bending down or getting up from a chair. Uh, and then in, in instead, he replaced them with stuff that's completely... Uh, not functional, like spinning around. And I don't know about you, but I don't spin around all day, but I do get up from my chair a lot. I do, uh, you know, pick up stuff from the floor. And, you know, it's kind of ironic because it's called functional patterns, but it's, it's probably one of the least functional ways to train. Goda, and that's something that they share with functional patterns, say that you should stay away from traditional heavy resistance training because it's gonna put you at risk of injuries. It is a joint destruction bloodbath. And the orthopedics and the neurosurgeons are gonna be there to slice you up and dice you up and make millions of dollars. Uh, I mean, there's always injuries in sports, but actually if you look at Ozanol in 2017, they did a systematic review and found that 
weightlifting and powerlifting are actually on the low end in terms of injury rates. Like much lower if you compare them to stuff like soccer and football, and they're comparable to like uh, track and field. Surprisingly, another sport that involves uh, heavy resistance training with weights, uh, CrossFit is also pretty low in terms of injury and has injury rates comparable to powerlifting and weightlifting as well. So obviously I think the FP and GoTo boys are wrong, but what's worse is that they're keeping people away from something that can have a potentially very large effect on injury reduction. So what we see from a systematic review by J.P. Bohr Larson in 2018 that uh, injury reduction programs that involve stuff like squatting and using barbells like bench press actually uh, can have very large effects in terms of injury reduction that can go up to 70%. The part that's hilariously ironic to me is the fact that you know, Goda is doing all of that in the name of injury reduction. And although their intentions might be good, basically what they're saying is, you know, you know this thing like gym training, which has been shown to kind of reduce injuries pretty well, don't do that. Instead, do this thing, which has been shown to basically have no connection with injuries, which is like focusing on a movement quality. So to wrap it all up, I don't care if you do any of the move you or go to or functional pattern exercises. As long as you don't pretend that they do what they claim to do, which is basically, you know, correcting imaginary uh, movement dysfunctions. If you like them, do them. Not enough people are exercising and I'm glad if they, you know, if you're exercising. Just don't shit on the other people because they're not doing it that way. And again, don't pretend that there's something special because they're not special, except at being especially bad at science. In short, uh, now the Aguilar from Functional Patterns, Mike from Move You, and Coach Gill from Goda have all one thing in common is that they rehashed old theories that have been outdated for years and pretended it was revolutionary, that they cracked the code of human movement, whereas um, science has taken a huge, nice, statistically significant and juicy dump all over those theories years ago. So I actually have a prize for that and it's an induction into the bullshit hall of fame over here. So congratulations guys. Uh, you're joining a Nick Caputo, which was the first inductee. That guy drinks his piss. So well done. Good job. All right. So thank you for watching this video. If you're not already subscribed, hit the subscribe button, share, like, follow, and comment what I should review next. Uh, you know, anything to let the algorithm know that I'm a good little boy would be really appreciated because these take a lot of time, like a lot of time to do. And yeah, so it helps. Thank you. Peace out. Pulled out the Polaroid candid Instagram stories. Elderly youth movement outcast from his parents' quarters. After a